Welcome, my name's Dr. Jason W. Morrison and I'm a theologist from New South Wales, Australia. Psychologists help people with themselves and other people and theologists help people with themselves and God. Hello, I'm Dr. Jason W. Morrison, theologist, New South Wales, Australia. Thank you for joining me. Um, as you, many of you may have heard, uh, Cardinal George Pell's appeal has been squashed. Um, what I want to do is go back into when the Cardinal was sentenced and point out to you something that I think is very significant in the context of what I've been trying to teach um, religious people and viewers of the fact that Romans chapter 7, but sin that it might be appear sinful, was producing death in me through what was good. Now, how can sin produce its quest to produce death and harm and um, child sexual abuse and all these other things that maim humanity through what is good. Well, that's just the way God planned it. So that sin through what? Sin through the commandment would become exceedingly sinful. Sin through this commandment would or might become exceedingly sinful. So when we think and this doesn't make sense to a lot of religious people. They don't want to hear this. They block their ears to it. They get um, irritated by this kind of um, understanding of the Bible. Sin, our sinful nature, empowers itself through the things we think we need to do or not do to make God happy or stop him from being sad and that's why these religious good intending all set out well and good intending people have been deceived by their sinful nature i want you to listen to this for a minute this this is the judge that um sentenced cardinal george pell and i want you to we're going to stop and comment as certain things get said that i want to point out to you Fourth, what you did was so egregious that it is fanciful to suggest that you may not have fully appreciated this. Your graphic sexual misconduct was not of a kind where you may have misjudged its gravity. Fifth, the fact that you offended twice against Jay further undermines the explanation that your offending was but an irrational, unthinking moment of lunacy. As to what drove you to offend in such a risky and brazen manner, I infer that for whatever reason, you were in fact prepared to take on such risks. Now, I want to just play that bit again, that little bit again. Bear with me. That you may not have fully appreciated this. Your graphic sexual misconduct was not of a kind where you may have misjudged its gravity. Fifth. The fact that you offended twice against Jay further undermines the explanation that your offending was but an irrational, unthinking moment of lunacy. As to what drove you to offend in such a risky and brazen manner, I infer that for whatever reason, you were in fact prepared to take on such risks. There is the question. What drove him... What drove Cardinal George Pell, an outstanding religious person, to commit such heinous acts? Well, I've shown you what has. We'll continue on. It's the fact that he was in an environment that encourages people to live in a way that will make God happy or stop him from being sad, which provokes arouses and empowers our sinful evil nature so that we begin to do things that we don't want to do and don't know that we're doing them we convince ourselves that it's our sinful nature convinces us that it's all okay i conclude that your decision to offend was a reasoned albeit perverted one and i reached that conclusion to the criminal standard to accept the argument of your counsel would mean that every offender who commits an offence which is brazen, out of character and spontaneous must be considered to have some form of mental impairment 
or some lapse in a capacity to reason or to think rationally. This is what the carnal nature does to the human mind. There is no basis in law or in principle for this proposition, and I reject it. Because the, um, the powers to be, who do a fantastic job, don't understand the nature of sin working through that which is good. Sin producing death through that which is good, which is the religious and organisational demands that they place on people that they believe will make God happy or stop them from being sad. R look, in the book of Romans, chapter 7, Paul goes over and over again about how sin dwells in him and that it's no longer he who does it, but sin that dwells in him. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, that is in his sinful nature, not in his body, nothing good dwells, for to will is present with me. But how to perform what is good, I do not find. Now this was a Pharisee of Pharisees who was living a life trying to make God happy or stop him from being sad. For the good that he willed to do, this was all the Mosaic law could do for him, he did not do. But the evil he willed not to do, that he practiced. Now, if I do what I will not to do, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. Now, this isn't just a slight matter. This is a major, um, serious theological reality and human reality that people need to know so that they don't end up in in courthouses wondering how as a Christian or as a um, religious person how they could possibly have ended up doing wrong. Paul said before the law came he lived but after it came he, he died. He, he, he had no longer any um, he was so ingrained into it that he began to be influenced by his sinful nature and he was able to recognize it. Certainly you were confident your victims would not complain. I will return to this. Now, confidence and self-deception are two different things. His confidence in thinking that the victims wouldn't complain was part of his being deceived by his sinful nature, he was completely and utterly deceived by his lusts. In any event, I reject your counsel's submission that the only inference available is that you are not acting as a rational thinking person. If I am required... The truth is, he was acting as a rational um, thinking person, but under the influence of his sinful, evil nature to identify other explanations as to why you, you were prepared to take on the risk of somebody walking in on you into the priest's sacristy, then I do so. By the jury's verdict, this offending occurred and no one walked into the priest's sacristy whilst you were offending. These are facts which I must act upon. You may at the time have been sufficiently confident that other church officials would not walk in during this period of time. Imagine he's in the middle of one of the great Catholic churches as one of the great Catholic ministers. This is how far the sinful nature will deceive you. Now this is a, I'm using this as an example because it's a, a major instance and it's in the public, but what about all the people that we'll never know that are harming and maiming? You would have had some knowledge as to their activities and whereabouts at the time. Moments before you had walked from the cathedral into the priest's sacristy corridors, you would have had some opportunity to interact with others and observe their movements. Another possible reasonable explanation for your preparedness to take on the risk of somebody walking into the sacristy is that you may also have subjectively believed that had this occurred, you could control the situation. You may have thought you could control the situation by reason of your authority as Archbishop, whether or not that belief was well-founded. 
the man was completely and utterly in a state of sin, of deception, of lust, by living a life under the regiment or regime of thinking that there was something that he needed to do or not do to make God happy or stop him from being sad. This judge is giving a great explanation, isn't he? Such a state of mind would have been extraordinarily arrogant, but the offending which the jury has found you have engaged in was, on any view, breathtakingly arrogant. These are all reasonable inferences available once it is assumed, as I must, that this offending actually occurred. I do not aggravate your sentence on the basis that you held any of these states of mind as to why you were prepared to take on the risks of somebody walking in. I simply highlight them as reasonable possibilities to further rebuff your counsel's submission that the only inference available uh, is that you could not have been acting in a rational thinking way. No, he wasn't, because the sinful nature, if you allow it to, will get you to do things that you don't want to do. For the good that I will to do, I do not do. But the evil I will not to do, that I practice. I'm telling you, it's all here in Romans 7. My goodness me, honestly, how, do we, how has this been missed for millenniums? I now turn to my assessment of the contextual circumstances and in particular to the issues of breach of trust and abuse of power. These are all relevant to my assessment of the gravity of your offending, including to your moral culpability. As Archbishop, it is true, as the defence submitted, that you did not have a direct, formal or standing role of supervision in relation to the victims, like that of a boarding master and boarder regular teacher and pupil, or babysitter and child. Other adults were charged with directly supervising the choristers when they attended at St Patrick's Cathedral, most notably the choir marshal, who was a teacher. And I want to go up to 36 minutes, and we're just going to look at another side of this now. 36 minutes here. Whoops. Okay. There, but, but as a consequence, there is no evidence of your remorse or contrition for me to act upon to reduce your sentence. I now turn to your background and to the evidence of your uh, good character. Now remember, I've always said, how is it that good intending people in what's supposed to be the best places to become good people end up doing evil. Cardinal Paul, you are 77 years of age. You were born in Ballarat where you grew up, were educated and then ordained. You then obtained a Doctor of Philosophy from uh, Oxford University before returning to Australia to work. By 1996 you were appointed Archbishop of Melbourne before being appointed Archbishop of Sydney. In 2014 you were appointed as first Prefect for the Secretary, Secretary of the Economy at the Vatican. At this time you moved to Rome where you remained until this matter arose. Self-evidently you have experienced an exceptional career within the Catholic Church. You are clearly an intelligent and hard-working man. That brings me to consider your life's contribution and your good character. See, this is where it doesn't make sense, does it? He's an outstanding person in the Catholic Church. What reduced him to become a criminal in his priestly garments? I'm trying to show people. I am trying and trying to show people that sin, that it might appear sin, produces death in us through what is good, through this God's standards. So that sin, through the standards, through the commandments, through the things we think we need to do or not do to make God happy or stop him from being sad, through the standards we think we need to keep, we become exceedingly sinful. I have been saying it and saying it and saying it. 
Evidence of an offender's otherwise good character is a factor that the sentencing judge is bound to consider. You have no prior convictions. Since this offending, you have not committed other offences. I have received a number of character references on the plea. These references come from people who have known you for many years in various professional and personal capacities. They speak of a man who dedicated his life to service, in particular to vulnerable members of the community. How can a man with such an outstanding record have fallen into such a horrible state of behaviour, of harm, abusing children? They describe a compassionate and generous person, especially to those experiencing difficulties in their lives. Someone who has a deep commitment to social justice issues and the advancement of education for young people. I note that these references were not challenged or contradicted by the prosecution. In addition to not having any prior convictions, I am satisfied that the evidence before me is that you are someone who has been, in the last 22 years since the offending, of otherwise good character. I sentence you upon the basis that these episodes, viewed together, constitute isolated offending. Good character is not enough to protect us from our sinful nature. When we come into religion and think that there's things we need to do or not do to make God happy or stop him from being sad, outside of the finished work of Christ, outside of that, let's just have a look quickly at this. Hebrews chapter um, 11 verse 6. Without faith, it is impossible to please. And it says there, some say God. For those who come to God must believe that he is and that he is the rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Now, how do you diligently seek God? By believing in the one he has sent and by believing in the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's just go to John 6 quickly. John 6, Jesus said himself, they come up to him and said, what shall we do to do the works of God? And Jesus said, well, believe in the one he has sent. They said to him, What shall we do that we may do the works of God? And Jesus answered and said, He didn't say, Well, do this and do that and this, that and other. He just said, Believe in the one he has sent. Believe in me. And you've done the work of God. But no, we have to go further than that. We have to do that's just can't be right. It couldn't be that simple. Oh, come on. Oh my gosh. If we go to Romans chapter six and verse fourteen. Romans 6, verse 14. Um, Therefore do not let sin reign in your mortal body, that you should obey it in its lusts, which is what's happened to Car Cardinal George Pell, hasn't it? But present yourselves to God as being alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. How? How? For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under law. You're not under the things you think you need to do or not do to make God happy or stop him from being sad, but under grace when we have... See, by faith you have been saved through grace, or by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourself, it is a gift of God. You have to abandon your idealisms. You have to... You have to reckon yourself to be dead indeed to sin, to the things you think you need to do or not do to make God happy or stop him from being sad, because all they're going to do is make you sin. But alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord, you've got to reckon yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ. Um, and how does sin have dominion over you? When you're under things you think you need to do or not do to make God happy or stop him from being sad. For me, this has become a scratch record, but I, I still think people struggle with the concept that God's standards could cause people to sin and sin terribly and viciously and very, very badly. 
The sting of death is sin, 1 Corinthians 15.56. And the strength of sin is what? The things we think we need to do or not do to make God happy or stop him from being sad. But, on the other hand, thanks be to God, who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. <laughs> We're trying to find the victory ourselves, but we already have it through the Lord Jesus Christ. And when we don't believe that and think there's something we can do or not do to make God happy or stop him from being sad, we're strengthening sin. We're allowing sin to have dominion over us. I've said it time and time and time again. It's not a criticism of Christianity or an attack against it. Look, if people want to go to church on a Sunday and all that, that's fine. But if they think there's something they need to do or not do to make God happy or stop him from being sad outside of the faith that we are given by Christ, Hebrews chapter 10, uh, chapter 12, let's look at Hebrews chapter 12 while I think of it. Just quickly, Hebrews chapter 12. We think that our faith's our own. My goodness me. Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, poor old Jehovah Witnesses think there's only 140, well, they wouldn't know how many are up there, but there's a multitude of witnesses up in heaven laying aside every, every weight. What's every weight? That's the things we think we need to do or not do to make God happy or stop him from being sad, which so easily ensnare us, let us run with endurance the race. Now, when you think run with endurance the race, you think that's something that you need to do or not do, um, all the things, the Christian activities, but it's not, that is set before us. Looking unto Jesus, what? The author and finisher of our faith. We've just got to look unto Jesus. He's the author and finisher of it all. He's done it all. Now, if you want to go out and evangelize and, um, you know, all that, that's fine. But don't think there's something you can do or not do to make God happy or stop him from being sad. All your works are voluntary. And that's all there is to it. I'm sorry if that takes away the joy of it, but Jesus, for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross. You know what you've got to endure? You've got to endure the fact of knowing that there's nothing you can do or not do to make God happy or stop him from being sad except look under Jesus. All the glory goes to the Lord. You've got to give up and let go. It's not a very exciting message for many people because they want to have something to do or not do to make God happy or stop him from being sad. But the Lord's not impressed with the things that we do. He's impressed by our faith. As I said earlier today, Abraham believed and it was accounted to him for righteousness. But he was a wretch of a man. Oh, he was not. He was the father of our faith. Well, how would you like it if... Um, how would your wife like it if you gave it to another man and said she was your half-sister? No one would ever speak to you again, would they? But Abraham still believed and it was accounted to... Get it right. It's not, what, it's not what we do or don't do. It's our belief. What shall we do to do the works of God? Believe. But just believe in me and get on with your life. Believe in the Lord Jesus. He said, believe in me. Oh, but that was never going to be enough. It was too easy, wasn't it? Well, good luck to you with the things you think you need to do or not do to make God happy or stop him from being sad. And uh, if you do harm yourself or somebody else, just be honest about it and don't wait till you get caught. This is Dr. Jason W. Morrison, Theologist, New South Wales, Australia. Bye for now. Yeah, Dr. Jason Morrison, Theologist again. I just want to say thank you for watching the videos and I uh, hope you got plenty of uh, self-rediscovery and freedom out of it. If you watched it on YouTube, please share or like. Um, maybe even comment if you watch it on Facebook. Like, comment, share. Um, but most of all, get out and live. This isn't a rehearsal. You've got a one-off life. Don't let your loyalty and your faithfulness blind you to the life that you should be experiencing. Till the next video, thank you for watching and bye for now.